Hello to the Grade 11 Life Science Learners. My name is Paul Wilton and I will be looking at the section on plant diversity. A question that is asked regularly, but why study plant diversity? As, you, as a South African, you and I know that we have a very rich cultural heritage, religious heritage, but what we also have is we have an amazing biological heritage. And part of that biological heritage is, of course, the number of plant species we have. If we look at the size of South Africa compared to the rest of the world, it is relatively small. But we have about 7.5% of all vascular plants on the entire planet, of which 80% is endemic, in other words, found nowhere else in the world, which means that we have an enormous biological heritage. And that is one of the main reasons why we would study plant diversity. Going to our first slide, just giving you an indication of some of the major plant species. Yeah, as I'm encircling it, that is one of the more primitive of your plant groups, which is the bryophytes. The next group is the pterophytes, or previously in some textbooks referred to it as the pteridophytes. They include your ferns. If we go further down, this is well known in South Africa. Um, some of your cycads, they fall under the group gymnosperms, which you'll chat about later. And then finally, our flowering plants, which are the angiosperms. Now, the main concepts that we will be looking at is, first of all, just chatting briefly about the classification of living organisms. Next, we'll be chatting about the characteristic of plants, which I know that you already know, uh, which you've already studied. And then just an indication, as I mentioned previously, of the four main groups, which is the bryophytes, the pteriophytes, the gymnosperms, and then finally your angiosperms, which are the flowering plants. Right, let's move on to biological classification. Our curriculum requires that we know the five kingdom system, and I have the names indicated here, but just a reminder for those of you who already know it, is the first group is of course your kingdom monera, and the monerans are basically your prokaryotes. Now remember the prokaryotes are the organisms that do not have a true cell nucleus, and they would include your viruses and bacteria. So ranging from the HIV to the TB bacterium, that would all fall under the kingdom Monera. Let's have a look at the next group. The next group, they are eukaryotes. Now the eukaryotes, of course, refers to the fact that they have a true nucleus, which basically means they have genetic material, and surrounding the genetic material, they would have a nuclear envelope or a nuclear membrane. What is unique about the, pro, uh, the protestants is the fact that the protestants are usually unicellular. Unicellular, in other words, they consist, the entire organism may consist of one cell, but what you also find as, they, as their complexity increases, these individuals may actually even group together as colonies. The next group is your fungi. I'm looking at them in terms of evolutionary development, in other words, in terms of complexity. So your fungi would basically be eukaryotes again, with their true nucleus. And what you find is, you find a plant-like structure, but it, is not, but it is not as many of the complex plants that we know. Um, very common examples here would be mushrooms, uh, for the athletes out there, um, the athlete's foot, which, is, which develops uh, in between the toes of uh, athletes, is also grouped, in other words, under this kingdom. The next kingdom is plantae, which includes all plants as we know them. So these again are eukaryotes. And if you remember, in grade 10 and grade 9, you studied the sections on the plant and animal cells. So basically, every single 
uh, member that fall under the kingdom plantae would have a characteristic animal cell, sorry, plant cell that, that you studied. In other words, this would mean that they have a true nucleus, that they would have plastids, which would include the most common one, the most well-known one, which is of course your chloroplasts, and that makes them quite unique, especially compared, as we compare them to the next kingdom, which is the kingdom animalia. Animalia, you can derive from that the word animal. So, what we find here again, eukaryotes, and they have the normal characteristic of all animal cells, which starts off, of course, with a major difference between animal cells and plant cells, which is the fact that they do not have a cell wall that contains cellulose. The other major difference is, of course, the fact that they don't have any plastids, including the plastids that give you color, like your chromoplasts, and then, of course, those that also give you color but involved in photosynthesis, that would be your chloroplasts. So that is the five kingdom system which you should know. Just to add to that, if you look at the screen, you'll see that there has been a slight change in terms of classification. I would just like to mention it, although it is not a direct requirement for the curriculum or for exam purposes. But just to give you an idea that the new, that there is a new three domain system. And what you basically find is the most primitive of it is your archaea bacteria, as indicated there. These are bacteria that can survive in very uh, salty environments. They can also survive in environments where the temperature is relatively high. Um, if you think of certain hot springs, etc., you may find some of these archaea bacteria. The next group is the U bacteria. So the EU that we put in front, EU, means true bacteria. So that would be the bacteria that we discussed under the kingdom Monera. And then last but not least, you can see here the eukarya. As you, may, as you heard me mention previously, when I refer to, to uh, all the kingdoms except the Monerans, I spoke about eukaryotes. So all of them would then fall under this group, in other words, under this domain. Let's move on. Just looking at the characteristics of, of plants, and let's just go through them one at a time. I think all of us know that in general plants are green, so they contain chlorophyll, which is an essential component of the plant because what it actually does, and remember you did it in grade 10, it is responsible for the absorption of sunlight energy, which eventually leads to its conversion into chemical potential energy or the glucose that we spoke about last year. So that's an important aspect of all plants. Do remember that even your plants that have red leaves, they also have very large amounts of chloroplasts, which contain this pigment chlorophyll the only difference between them and other plants is that the amount of chromoplasts, which usually give color, is greater than the number of chloroplasts, and that's where you sometimes get the red color, etc. What also happens is, if you think of autumn, when you have the orange, yellow, brownish colors, what basically happens is, because the metabolism of the plant is decreasing, what would happen is a lot of the chloroplasts are converted to chromoplasts, and that's where you see the color change. So let's look at the next characteristic of plants. They are, of course, multicellular, as mentioned previously when I discussed the five kingdom system, uh, the kingdom plantae. So they are eukaryotes, but they are also multicellular. Very important there. Then, of course, major difference between the plant and animal cells is, of course, the fact that they have this compound, which is cellulose, one of your carbohydrates. It is present in a cell structure called the cell wall, which we, of course, do not find in any of your animal cells. Let's continue. There are large vacuoles filled with cell sap. Okay, you remember the vacuole with the cell sap? And, of course, the surrounding membrane uh, is called the tonoplast. So you remember, you remember most of this from grade 10. 
Plastids, just a reminder that plastids is the umbrella group and under plastids we then have, for example, your leucoplasts, which are the plastids that are responsible for storing food and that, as an example, you find in your potatoes, your rice, etc., your millies or your maize, etc. That's the one group, your leucoplasts. The second group is the chromoplasts, which give color, I mentioned it previously, and then also your chloroplasts, that, are, that also give color, but the primary function is, of course, the fact that it has chlorophyll in that absorbs sunlight energy. Next, we find that plants may reproduce sexually. In other words, when we talk about sexual reproduction, we usually refer to sex cells or we refer to gametes, which I'll talk about later. So that would be sexual reproduction, so they are different gametes. And then, of course, you'll see in science, asexual. So the a as an addition, in other words, as a prefix, usually means not. So asexual reproduction basically means it's not sexual, which means that there are no gametes involved. And there are different ways in which they reproduce asexually. We see that they have complex life cycles. And we'll chat about it in a lot of detail later on. But just to mention that you have all plants have a gametophyte stage or, gener or generation and a sporophyte generation. But we'll talk about that in more detail later. Right, let's just look at the classification of these plants, the biological classification. So what you basically find is we are talking about terrestrial or la terrestrial or land plants and you'll see it breaks up into two groups the one group is called the non-vascular group and as you can see indicated there that includes the moss or the bryophytes the other group is of course vascular plants so what we find here is we find two groups and the one group is called the seedless or the gymnosperms and the other one is called the seed bearing, or these would be the angiosperms. So uh, the seed bearing, sorry, and under the seed bearing group, there would be the angiosperms, which, oh goodness, the angiosperms, which is the one group, and that's the normal flowering plants, which we know. And the second group is called the gymnosperms, they also produce seeds, but their seeds are not covered. The prefix gymno refers to naked. So you can see the groups that we are going to discuss. If I must just indicate again, there we have our mosses. There we have our ferns. Here we have the flowering plants. And then we have the gymnosperms, which of course examples would be your cycads, your uh, your pines, etc. Let's move on to the evolutionary development of plants. If we have a look at this diagram, you'll see, and please take note of this because it is a very important aspect of the grade 12 syllabus. Uh, it refers to the evolutionary development of plants, and if you look very carefully, you can actually see that there we have an ancestral green algae, which would fall under the kingdom protester. And what is important to remember is, as you can see, it then develops from here and it may then develop into different groups of organisms. And if we have a quick look, we'll see that the most primitive of those groups is, of course, the bryophytes, which we'll chat about later on. It then becomes a bit more complex as you see the evolutionary development happening and it develops. Next group would be your ferns. And then, of course, as I mentioned previously, your gymnosperms. And the most complex of all is, of course, your flowering plants, which is your angiosperms. The idea here is, if we go down at the bottom here, is in terms of evolutionary development, it had a common ancestor. And from the common ancestor, it then branches off into different groups or different fa families of plants.
The next section relates to the alternation of generations. And I want to put a, a very important focus on this section because it is also in the grade 12 syllabus. So what we're looking at is alternating, in other words, switching from one to the other. That's your alternation. And then, of course, if we look at your generations, there are two of them that we need to know. The first one is the gametophyte generation. Now, if we break this word up, we'll see that gameto, of course, refers to, or from that you can deduce gametes, and phyte, or as uh, from, the, from its root phyta, means plant. So you can actually look at it as the plant that will produce the gametes. That's the one side. On the other side, we have a sporophyte generation. So those are the only two generations that you need to know anything about. So that would be the gametophyte generation and sporophyte generation. So let's just break up the sporophyte. Sporophyte, in other words, you can look at the, the, the prefix. And the prefix, of course, refers to spore. And then, of course, phyta again, or phyte from the word phyta, which basically means that this would be the plant that would be responsible for producing spores. So let's just continue and we'll see that your gametophyte generation is always haploid while your sporophyte generation is always diploid. Now just as a reminder, haploid means that there is one set, as you can see there's one N, there is one set of chromosomes, where in the case of diploid, as you can see, there's two N. It basically means that there are two sets of chromosomes. Now, the question is, but how do we get, if I must start with the sporophyte generation, in other words, this would be my starting point here, to get from the sporophyte generation to the gametophyte generation, as I mentioned previously, we will have the production of spores. But look very carefully. If you look at this, if you look at the slide, you'll actually see if I can just change the color. There is a demarcation as indicated there. The section at the bottom would be diploid and the section on top, all aspects of it, would be haploid. So what that means is if we go from, if we go from the sporophyte generation starting here and it produces spores which are haploid, it means that meiosis will take place. Now, if we refer back to grade 10, there are basically two types of cell division. The one type of cell division is mitosis. Now, remember, mitosis basically is involved in making exact copies of cells. So, in your body, in my body right now, mitosis is taking place as it is replacing millions and millions of dead cells or damaged cells. So remember, mitosis is responsible for making exact copies of cells. On the other hand, you'll see in the middle of the screen here, you'll see there's a reference to the second process, which is meiosis. Now, meiosis is sometimes also referred to as the reducing division, which basically means that it will reduce the number, uh, the chromosomal number. So you, if you look at the screen, you'll see we go from diploid, which has two sets of chromosomes, to haploid, in other words, the amount of chromosomes are reduced. And that is a, that is a very important function, in other words, of the meiosis. The next section is very important because it will be the focus of what we will be talking about. I will be, to, I will be chatting again for each of the four groups about the life cycles, etc. But our focus is the following aspects. So if we have a look, these four groups, there are four of them, the four groups will be discussed in terms of whether they have the following. Do they have true leaves? Do they have true roots? Do they have vascular tissue? And we know vascular tissue as the xylem and the phloem. Remember, xylem responsible for transport of water and its dissolved minerals, while phloem is, of course, responsible for 
the transport of uh, organic nutrients. Do the groups, do they produce seeds or do they produce spores? And do they produce fruit? And last but not least is, of course, and this is why I will sometimes talk about the life cycle, although we don't need to know it in any serious detail, is whether the life cycle of the organism, as I mentioned, as it goes from sporophyte generation to gametophyte generation and then back to sporophyte generation, whether it actually requires water as part of its reproductive cycle or process. Right, let's have a look at our first group. Our first group is our bryophytes. And the bryophytes are considered to be some of the most primitive plants. Now let me just mention from the, from the word go is that you'll actually see that from the bryophytes as we go to the pterophytes, to the gymnosperms, and then eventually to the angiosperms, you will see that there's actually an increasing level of complexity, which basically means that if we say that the bryophytes are some of the most primitive plants, that automatically means that in terms of plant structure, or the basic plant structure that we know, for example, having roots, leaves, uh, stems, flowers, they don't have those complex structures making them some of the most primitive uh, plants on the planet. So as I mentioned, some of the most primitive plants, you'll also see that they do not have a cuticle. And the reason why they do not have a cuticle, you can actually deduce from the next section, is they are usually found in moist regions and very important, shady re regions. That basically means that they don't need the protective covering of the cuticle, which we all know is primarily responsible for limiting the amount of transpiration that actually takes place. So if it is in an area that is relatively moist and where there's very little direct sunlight, they don't need the cuticle. If we go further down and have a look, as I mentioned previously, they don't have any real roots. And I'll show you in the illustration now that they actually have primitive root-like structures which are called rhizoids. They don't have any vascular tissue, which is also, in other words, they do not have xylem and phloem, which is also one of the reasons why your bryophytes do not grow to uh, very large sizes. They are relatively small. They just mentioned they are small because they don't have those. And then a little a summary in terms of the structure. You'll see that it doesn't have no true roots, stems, and leaves. And the plant body in this case is then called a thallus. So for our purposes, a thallus is basically a plant-like structure that doesn't have the defined organs or structures that we know are common of most plants. In other words, they do not have roots, stems, and leaves. Then, of course, it does need, it does need water for reproduction. And the reason why it needs water for reproduction, well, which makes, uh, which tends to make sense because they are found in these moist regions. So what we also then find is they produce spores, and I'll discuss that, and you'll pick these aspects up as we go through the life cycle. Um, and then last but not least, just looking at some of the more common examples, and these are our mosses. And for those of you who aren't entirely sure, go and look at regions where at the bottom of uh, the taps, the, 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 um, the taps outside your house and the areas where that region where the tap is present that doesn't have a lot of direct sunlight. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see a greenish, almost like a mat-like structure. And if you look at it very carefully, you'll actually see it's a large grouping of individual plants. And these are basically what our mosses, uh, these are actually examples of our mosses. So if we have a look here, 
That's just showing you what it looks like in more detail. And on the next slide, we look more at its structure. So this is basically, there you can see, so this is the structure that you will see when you look at the bottom of the tap, as I mentioned, and you see those the, 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 the little mat-like structure, and you look at it, you'll see individual plants, and that green section that you see would actually be this section that I'm indicating here. And this is, of course, don't forget, this is, of course, referred to as the thallus. Double L, it's your thallus. Why? Because if you look further down, it doesn't have any real roots. In other words, it has rhizoids. You can see there's no defined stem. So what they refer to here is a stem-like structure. There are no real leaves. In other words, that's why it is referred to as leaf-like structures. So this would then also, for interest sake, this would represent the gametophyte generation, which you know by now is, of course, the haploid generation. If we look a little bit further, and sometimes if you look at the mosses present at home, you'll actually see, but hold it, it was green, let's, for argument's sake, about two weeks ago. Now it seems to have, now it's still green, but it has a brownish appearance. What has happened is that you can see the, yeah, from your gametophyte, you now have a stalk developing, and here you have a capsule that actually has sporangia in it. And this structure here represents the sporophyte generation. In other words, this is the generation that is going to produce spores. And if you, if you were listening carefully, I spoke about sporangia, which is basically the structure that is responsible for producing the spores. Don't forget that your sporophyte generation is, of course, diploid. So that's the basic structure of your moss plant. Let's move on to the reproduction in moss. If you look at the illustration provided, and you do not need to know this in extreme detail, but what we are looking at is various aspects that were discussed previously in terms of the structure and anatomy of the moss, but also relating to the alternation of generations. So, as I mentioned previously, the green section that we initially see is, of course, the section here. And that is your gametophyte generation. So that's what we would presume to be the moss plant. So that is the gametophyte generation. And don't forget that the gametophyte generation, of course, being haploid. What then happens is, there are structures in the gametophyte generation that would produce, as we mentioned, your sperm, and it would produce egg. And we know that if these two fuse during a process called fertilization, what would happen is you would then produce a structure that would develop into your sporophyte. And your sporophyte, indicated here, is of course diploid and this diploid structure would then undergo meiosis and as mentioned here in the sporangia you will then find that spores are produced in other words meiosis is going to take place and what happens is the spores that are produced indicated there these are of course now haploid so we go from, let's just recap. So we go from the gametophyte generation, which is haploid. It goes, it produces sperm and eggs, which then fuse to produce a zygote, which eventually develops into the sporophyte. Because this is haploid, and haploid, it basically means that we then end up with a diploid structure. This diploid structure then undergoes meiosis, and meiosis then leads to the production of spores, which is, which is haploid. And the spores then develop into an intermediate structure referred to as the protonema, 
which you don't need to know, but just indicating that the spores will then germinate, well, uh, something similar to germination will take place. It will develop into a structure called the protonema, and the protonema will then grow and develop into this gametophyte structure, which we referred to previously. Again, you do not need to know the extreme detail, but what you do need to know is the alternation from the one stage, uh, one generation, gametophyte generation, to the sporophyte generation, and how it gets from the sporophyte generation back to the gametophyte generation, which is, of course, the alternation of generations referred to previously. Let's move on. So, if I can indicate to you, just look at the diagram here. This is sometimes what you would see. You would see this whole mush of little gr green plant-like structures. So that's the gametophyte generation. So this is basically what you would see under the tap, as I referred to, uh, referred to previously. So what do you need to know that is essential for the exams? The following aspects are very important. First of all, you'll see that your bryophytes, which is the first group, the most primitive of the groups that we're talking about, they do not have leaves, roots, and stems, etc. Also, they do not have vascular tissue, which of course is your xylem, your xylem, and your phloem. They produce spores, as we mentioned, so they don't produce seeds. Because they produce spores, they obviously will not produce fruit, because the fruit is usually associated with your production of seeds. And because they live in a moist environment, their fertilization, of course, requires water. So these are the five major aspects that you must know for exam purposes. So that concludes the section on the bryophytes. Our next group of plants refers to the example indicated here, and I think everybody has at least seen one of these examples, is of course your ferns. They fall under the group called the pterophytes, or previously called the tridophyta. So if you have a look, if we have a look at the base, some of the basic, some of the basic uh, differences, remember, when we spoke about the bryophytes, we said that it does not have any vascular tissue. That's why it was relatively small plants. You've seen ferns at home or at relatives places that can grow up to quite, uh, for example, would grow up to 30 centimeters, maybe even larger. Uh, 50 centimeters and if you've ever seen any of the documentaries of the Amazon rainforest etc you'll see that they can actually grow up to a few meters in height so let's just have a look at some of the important aspects that we need to know is you'll see that it does contain vascular tissue in other words it does have your xylem and your phloem present so you can see this group of plants is of course more complex than the previous group which was the mosses or the bryophytes. So if we look, they are also found, so you can see some characteristics here, they are also found in moist, shady habitats. Next you'll see that there are underground stems, okay, again remember the when we spoke about the structure of the moss we said that it it is called a thallus because it doesn't have true stems, roots, leaves, etc. In this case, you'll see that the pterophytes, they actually have underground stems, they have roots, and they have large leaves, which are called fronds, which I will discuss in one of the next slides. They also produce, these ferns also produce spores, which of course means that the seeds are not present and automatically it means that there will be no fruits produced. And last but not least is that the spores that are produced are produced by sporangia, 
and they are grouped together. And that structure is called a sorus or sori, that is the plural. I promise you that you have seen this in one of the firms. So let's just move on and look at some of the structure. You don't need to know this in detail, but just to give you a frame of reference in terms of what we spoke about and what we are still going to speak about. Just looking at the slide, you'll see that it indicates the various parts of your fern. So just to indicate, we mentioned that the fern has through leaves, and here you can see the leaf blade. The leaf blade, of course, is then made up of smaller structures. You can see these little leaf-like structures. In other words, it's actually a smaller part of the larger leaf. In other words, it's kind of a subdivision of the larger leaf. What you can then see is, as you find in your leaves, you have this stalk here that actually connects the various parts. So you can see that the fern has true leaves. If we look at other aspects, we'll see here at the bottom the rhizome. If you remember, rhizome is basically the stem of your fern. It is the underground stem that basically gives rise to other ferns. Next time you visit your, or you have a look at home, or you visit somebody, you'll see that there's a rhizome present. And what happens is there's an extension that grows out, and then you'll see the next fern growing out there. So you actually find that the rhizome is basically then the underground stem. And last but not least, in terms of basic plant, ana plant structure or anatomy, is of course that you find these roots at the bottom. So you can see that the fern has leaves, it has stem, and it has roots. So let's look at the reproduction, uh, especially in terms of the life cycle of your fern. Again, just to make a note, you don't need to know intense and in detail structure and anatomy of, for example, the intermediate stages like the gametophyte, etc., uh, the gametophyte generation, etc. But you do need to understand the basic life cycle, which is the alternation of generations that we discussed at the beginning. So let's just have a look. Starting off, we have the sporophyte, as you can see indicated there, which is always, which is always diploid. So this sporophyte. In other words, the, le uh, the, the, the fern plant as we know it, that is basically your sporophyte generation. So what happens is it undergoes meiosis, and we know there are two types of division. The one copying division, in other words, that's mitosis again. And then meiosis, in this case, of course, reduces it from the diploid number of chromosomes, as you can see here, to spores that are as indicated in the illustration, that are haploid. So what happens to these spores? These spores will then germinate, and these spores will then undergo mitosis. So what does mitosis do? Mitosis makes more copies, exact copies of the cells, which basically means that it will then grow and increase in size. What we then have, we then have the gametophyte generation. The gametophyte generation is a structure, a, there you can see a heart-shaped structure called the prothallus. And because it's the gametophyte generation, it is quite obviously also haploid. So now, gametophyte means that this is the plant life cycle, uh, sorry, the stage of the plant's life cycle where gameto, it's going to produce sex cells. The sex cells that it of course produces is of course male and female. So you would have, if I can just extend it here, so again, you have sperm cell and you have egg cells. So just to indicate,
you have your prothallus, which looks something like that, which is heart-shaped. And you would then have the female structures there, which are called the ochagonia, which you, you don't need to specifically know those names. And you have the male structures, the antheridia, which produce the sperm. So what you would find is, you would actually find that the sperm actually needs to swim from this point, in other words, to where the egg cells are present. And to swim, they of course need a very thin film of water. That is another reason why the fern is always present in moist and shady environments. Moist, of course, so there's enough water. Shady, so that there's not too much evaporation. So the fact that we then have fertilization, there we go. So we have fertilization. And the fertilization leads or takes us from haploid and haploid, brings the two chromosomes, the chromosome packages together, and we then end up with a diploid package, which is, of course, your zygote. The zygote will undergo mitosis, which basically means, again, it makes more copies of the same thing, which leads to growth. And from the zygote, it will then grow to the sporophyte generation. And in that way, the life cycle will then continue. So to summarize, the most important sections in terms of content that you need to know for the pterophytes if we have a look, we'll see that they do have, it has through leaves and the roots. It also has a stem, which of course is the underground stem, the rhizome that I spoke about. It has vascular tissue present, your xylem and your phloem. It produces spores, as we mentioned. And these spores are produced in sporangia, which, of course, we find under the leaves. Then, of course, because spores are produced, that automatically means that there are no seeds present. No seeds means that there will be no fruit produced by the plant. And last but not least, as I mentioned, in the case of the prothallus, you find that the sperm cells actually need to swim from the male structures, the antheridia, to the ochagonia, which are the female structures, and they swim in a very thin film of water, which, as I mentioned, is one of the important reasons why ferns must be present in moist and shady environments, so that there's always this uh, thin film of water which will ensure fertilization. The third group of plants that we study under this section is the gymnosperms. Now, if I break this word up into prefix and suffix, gymno means naked. And the sperm, of course, refers in this case to seeds. So these are a unique group of plants that have been on the planet for millions of years. And what is unique about them is that they produce seeds that are naked. So if we look, they are well known as the conifers. Conifers, so that's where the word cone comes from. And your examples here would be your uh, pine trees. That would be the most common examples. Uh, the pine trees, and we know that the pine trees have a set of male and female cones. So there are separate reproductive structures there. We also know that they have a thick waxy cuticle. And the reason for that is, of course, to limit the loss of water by transpiration. It has vascular tissue. So here again, as mentioned previously, it will have xylem and it will have phloem present. And actually, if you think about it, your pine trees grow to quite a few meters. So you would have pine trees of about, on average, about three to four meters high. And the reason why they can grow that high is because they have a very complex vascular system. And that is, that is one of the reasons for that height. Important for us, 
is, of course, that it has through roots. You've seen those extensive roots that they have. The stems, it's part of the tree, and then, of course, leaves. What it does, and this is what makes it unique, I mentioned previously, is that the seeds are not covered. So they are not enclosed by an ovary. And that is when we say that the seeds are naked, and that's where the name gymnosperm comes from. Because it doesn't have, it does, it's not enclosed by the ovary, and although it produces seeds, that automatically means that there will be no fruit developing. It is pollinated by wind. It is pollinated by wind. And as indicated in the, uh, the illustration below, you can see there's just one of your examples of the cones that you find in these gymnosperms. And there you have a very popular example of a cycad, which is also very well known in South Africa. Let's go on to reproduction in gymnosperms. Again, I want to remind you, you do not need to know this in any excessive detail. The idea here, again, is looking at the alternation of generations. In other words, looking for gametophyte and sporophyte generations. Looking at how they, the number of chromosomes is converted from haploid to diploid. That, of course, takes place during fertilization. And then, of course, what also then happens is going from diploid to haploid, that requires meiosis. So you don't need to know the extreme detail, but it also just gives you a sense of the alternation of generations in the life cycle of the gymnosperm. So let's have a look. We start off, as we usually do, looking at the sporophyte generation. Sporophyte generation, we know, is diploid, which basically means that it will undergo as you can see there, it undergoes meiosis. So that takes us from the diploid, that takes us from the diploid to the haploid. From diploid to haploid. And now you'll simply see that the, this, these structures, there you can see the spore referred to and sporangium. So the sporophyte then gives rise to spores, which in this case are differentiated, uh, differentiated into megaspores uh, and microspores, indicating male and female. You don't need to know it in any detail, but just indicating that there are these different structures. What would happen is, there you can see, again, undergoing meiosis. As it continues to develop, as it continues to develop, it now produces sperm and egg. So as you can see, this section here, this is where you would find your gametophyte generation. And the gametophyte generation, as mentioned previously, is of course haploid. The gametophyte generation then gives us the sperm and egg cells that we mentioned previously. Sperm and egg cell would lead to fertilization. So the zygote produced, which develops into the embryo, is of course diploid, and it eventually develops into the sporophyte, which in this case, again, is basically the plant that we see. So when you see a pine tree outside, that is basically the main representation of the sporophyte generation. Then just mentioning, it is it is very well known in South Africa. Here you have the Mojaji cycads uh, in Limpopo, in the northern regions. There's actually an entire reserve uh, allocated to these Mojaji cycads. There you can see beautiful Mojaji cycads. And then, of course, also very well known in South Africa is, of course, the broodworm. Cycad, which is, of course, uh, possibly one of the most expensive plants in the country. And I think in grade 10, you, uh, there was reference to the fact that 
some of them are actually tagged with radioactive tags nowadays um, because they are so expensive and uh, a lot of them are actually being stolen all over the country. So they actually have these radioactive tags. So gymnosperms, so gymnosperms actually one of our valuable resources. So there you can see there are two of the examples. So let's just summarize some of the most important aspects of the gymnosperms. First of all, as mentioned, they have leaves, roots, and stems. They do have vascular tissue, that's why they grow to the great heights. They produce cones, and in the cones there are seeds. But remember we mentioned that the difference between the gymnosperm and the angiosperm is that the seeds of the gymnosperm are naked, which basically means it doesn't have an ovary, and if it doesn't have an ovary, it of course won't develop into a fruit, or a fruit won't develop from it. And then, of course, we mentioned that we need wind for pollination, which basically means that fertilization in the case of the gymnosperms is independent of water, so it does not require water for fertilization. They're just showing you some of the common examples. Let's move on to the last group. The last group is called the angiosperms. So there you have your flowering plants and as you can see they are some of the most advanced plants on the planet. It has varying cuticle and as we studied under the section water transport we also spoke about the different types of plants that we find. As an example you would have your hydrophytes which are found in where there's large amounts of water mesophytes in moderate amounts of water and xerophytes which would include your cacti etc which are found in areas where there is very little water like your deserts, your karoo etc. So that obviously indicating here the varying cuticle basically means that your hydrophytes would have the thinnest cuticle while the xerophytes would of course have the thickest cuticle. Being in a dry environment it of course cannot allow excessive loss of water. Then we'll see, oh, I just mentioned it now, that they are found in, different, uh, in all different types of environments. You studied, you studied earlier the section on water transport, so you know that it has a very complex, it has a very complex vascular system uh, with your xylem. And remember they spoke about the additions of lignin and the spiral thickenings and the annular thickenings, so indicating how complex it is your phloem with the companion cells, etc. So it is a very complex, it is a very complex vascular system. Through roots, leaves and stems as mentioned. Seeds, in this case, develop in an ovary. Very important. And remember, this is the major difference between your angiosperm and your gymnosperm. Gymnosperm, we said, we have a seed, but the seed does not develop in the ovary. In the case of angiosperms, as you can see, it develops in an ovary and then of course if it develops in that ovary it will of course then lead to the production of fruit as we know it. Some of the common examples and I think here you, here you will know many many examples. Here just showing you an example of an orchid but possibly more well known is of course your lilies and then a very common angiosperm roses, etc. As we've studied previously, we know that there are two main groupings of angiosperms and that we know about the monocots and the dicots or the more complex terminology is your monocotyledonous and your dicotyledonous plants. Just, remi just a reminder that monocots, mono of course referring to one, the cotyledonous of course refers to the cotyledon which you find inside the seed itself. So your monocots would have one and your dicots would of course have two. So that's of course the first major difference between them. Then having a look 
And the easiest way to distinguish between the two is to always use an example. If we think of one of the most popular monocots in the country, it's of course millies or maize, or even just the grass that you have outside in the garden, that would be an example of a monocot. Where your dicot, you can take something more complex, like a rose or even any of your fruit uh, trees, etc. So, if we compare them, think of, think of the grass at home. If you look at the little leaves, you'll see that they are parallel veined. In other words, that's how your veins run. Where in the case of your other flowering plants, you can see that there's this net-like division of the veins. So, you'll see that we discussed this previously in, when we spoke about plant tissue. And when we looked at the monocots, you see that they have scattered vascular tissue. And your dicots, of course, have this well-organized ring uh, inside the plant. In terms of roots itself, if you take, uh, if you take uh, uh, a piece of grass and you pull it out of the ground, you'll actually see that there's a fibrous root system where something more complex, any, something more complex like your roses, etc., you'll find that if you, if you take it out of the ground, you'll actually see that it has a tap root system, which basically means that there's one major root, and then, of course, from that you find smaller lateral roots growing. If you look at the pollen, you'll see that there's one opening in the pollen of your monocots, and there's three openings in the pollen in your dicots. And last but not least, the easiest way to identify them, especially when they are flowering, remember, monocots and dicots are both examples of flowering plants. So what you find is, if you look at the flowers, you'll see that they are arranged in groups of three. If you have a look at the flowers of especially your petals, etc., and you look at the, its arrangement, you'll see it may be arranged in groups of four or five. In other words, more than three, which would include your monocots. Continuing with the angiosperms, but just a friendly reminder that the next section is not required in extreme detail in grade 11, but will form part, uh, an essential part, of reproduction in plants in grade 12. So let's just have a look, and I suppose most of you already know this. If you look at the basic structure of your angiosperm flower, you'll see that there are two sections. And if we look at these two sections, you can see that we have this section here, which is called the pistil, and that is the female structure. You have the stigma on which, you, on which the pollen lands, the style, the tube down which the pollen is transported, and then of course you have your ovules inside the structure referred to as the ovary. Now remember, this is what makes the angiosperms different from the gymnosperms, is that you can see here, you find the ovules, and so this is where your seeds will eventually develop. It develops and is covered, it is covered by, an, by the ovary, which is why it's angiosperm. In the case of gymnosperm, you don't have the ovary present. If we look at the other structures, the male structures, you'll see, choose a different color, Let's just see if this one will work. We have the anther, which is here, where you have the production of the pollen, which is basically, in the case of the angiosperm flower, it is representative of the male reproductive structures or the male sex cells. And then, of course, you have this filament, which runs down here, and the filament then basically attaches it to the receptacle at the bottom. Other sections is of course the sepals, which, if I can just indicate there, your sepals here, which are basically the chlorophyll containing protective structures, especially when the flower is still in the bud. 
So you have the sepals that will then protect the petals and as it starts blossoming, it then, uh, it then basically uh, has a secondary role. So there you have the basic structure. So as a reminder, you would have, if I can just go up here and just remind you, that the internal structure here, the pistil, that is the female, that is the female section. And then of course here at the bottom, you then have the male section, which is then called the stamen, where we have the, on top here, those little structures there, the anther, and the anthers, that is where, of, where the male reproductive structures, the pollen, are, pro are produced. Let's continue. Now here you'll see, and if you noticed, starting from the bryophytes, except for the, uh, uh, well, the structure also becomes more and more complex as we go to the pterophytes. It becomes even more complex when we got to the gymnosperms, and it's even more complex when we get to the angiosperms. If you remember, these diagrams where I had the indicating the alternation of generations, you remember that in the case of the bryophytes, it was a very simple structure. In the case of the ferns, your pterophytes, it became more complex, and you can see this is, possible, uh, this is the most complex of the lot. Again, you do not need to know this in extreme detail, but I can assure you that this will be in the grade 12 syllabus for next year. But just to indicate, what we basically have is we have the flower. So that is where you can see that is the sporophyte generation. The sporophyte generation, of course, being diploid, as we've mentioned in each and every scenario. Then, of course, we also mentioned that we have, if I can just change the color, there we have the male structure and your female structures. Okay? So what happens here is, of course, we find meiosis developing. Oh, sorry, meiosis taking place. And meiosis would then, of course, you can see meiosis then separates this from, uh, in other words, diploid on the one side and haploid on the other side. What eventually, in this life cycle, as it continues, you'll actually see that. So remember, we go on this side from diploid on this side to haploid. So how do we go from uh, diploid to haploid? The plant must undergo meiosis. And then, of course, we have male and female structures produced. The male structure in this case will, of course, be the pollen. And there you can see the pollen. The female structures, of course, would contain the eggs. And then, of course, as you find these two fusing, we find them fusing during a process called fertilization. So we have haploid and haploid that then fuse and then forms diploid again, and in that way, the life cycle continues. Just to mention that here we mentioned the sporophyte generation. In the case of the, in the case of the pollen that germinates, that is when you have the male gametophyte generation, and inside the ovary, that is where, at a certain stage of development, that is where you will find the female gametophyte generation. So, let's summarize and look at some of the most important, some of the more important aspects that we need to know. So, in terms of structure, it has roots, leaves, and stems. Stems, inside the stems, of course, primarily we'll find our xylem and our phloem, which is our vascular tissue. It produces flowers, and we all know that the flower is, of course, responsible for attracting the pollinators, like your bees, flies, etc. It then also produces seeds. Very important, the seeds are, of course, enclosed in an ovary, making it angiosperm and not gymnosperm. And that ovary, of course, then develops into a fruit which, of course, encloses the seeds. 
Remember, the primary function of the fruit in the case of your angiosperms would, of course, be to attract your dispersal agents. Because what you and I would do is we would eat the fruity part of the apple. We would then throw the seeds that are present inside the core. We would then throw that away. So in that way, we then become the dispersal agents of the angiosperms. And last but not least, there's no mention or any requirement of water for fertilization. So fertilization in this case is, of course, independent of water. And here you have a few examples of your flowering plants or angiosperms. Now, just as a little tip, just a uh, just as a little tip, we've discussed a lot of detail and I've ended off each group indicating the important aspects that we need to know for exams. A little exam tip or, uh, or test or study tip is, and this is what I did here, is take all that information and put it into a simple, one simple table. And you can see here, there we have the section on features, in other words, Remember the thallus that we spoke about in the case of the bryophytes? We spoke about our ferns that have the large leaves and the roots present. In other words, becoming a little bit more advanced. The gymnosperms, they also have that, your, that enormous trees like your pine tree, etc. In other words, also indicating through leaves, stems, etc. And then, of course, your angiosperms showing the same, showing the same uh, anatomy. So what I want you to see is you actually have a simple, and a simple comparison, but also easy to study. What else did we need to know? We also needed to know about the vascular tissue, whether it is present or not. And we spoke about the bryophytes or your mosses, which are relatively small, which basically meant that they wouldn't have any of the vascular tissue present. Your ferns can grow to different heights, so they would have vascular tissue, as would the large pine trees, which are examples of your gymnosperms, and then finally, many of our flowering plants that we discussed earlier when we spoke about the transport of water, referring to the fact that we have a very complex vascular system. Next, we needed to know about fertilization. And we remember that the gymnosperms were found or present in moist, shady environments. So there's usually water present. So that meant it would be dependent on, that would be dependent on water for fertilization. As in the case of the gametophyte stage of the fern, we also found that it needed water for fertilization. And the last two more complex groups, your gymnosperms and your angiosperms, independent of water for fertilization. The last aspect we needed to know is about the production of seeds or spores. We spoke about the sporophyte generation, the brownish sporophyte generation in the moss. It had sporangia and produced spores. The same in the case of your ferns and the sori and the sporangia that we spoke about. So the first two groups would produce spores. We know that sperm or the spermia or spermae, that basically refers to seeds. So it already tells you that your gymnosperms would have seeds present and your angiosperms would also have seeds present. But there is a slight difference between them in that you'll find that the gymnosperms are not enclosed in an ovary. That's why they are the naked seeds. And in the case of your angiosperms, they, of course, are enclosed in an ovary. And that is, of course, where we get the fruit as in the case of many of the fruits that we consume, like apples, etc., etc. So there you have a nice summary. I also hope that you use this idea to make your studying more effective. In other words, hopefully that you study
smarter and not harder. We have in our syllabus where there is a reference to uh, very unique plants and one of the most unique plants on the planet is of course the Velvetsia. Velvetsia which we find primarily you can see here in the Namib Desert it's endemic so it's found there nowhere else in the world also considered to be one of the most bizarre plants and this is basically what it looks like. What makes it so unique what makes it so unique is the fact that it actually has two permanent leaves. It has two permanent leaves that will actually be present for the rest of its life. And talking about the rest of its life, what also makes it unique is that the plant actually lives to around about 500, maybe even to 600 years uh, of age. Okay? So there you can see the one with the flowers. There you have your female Velvetsia. And there you have your male Velvetsia. So, just a few things to mention. Two permanent leaves, making it very unique, absolutely unique. These you'll see, uh, you may have seen in the previous diagram, they actually become torn. So if I go back to the previous slide, and you see there, so here you can actually see, so this is, these would be basically one leaf on this side, one on that side, but as you can see, it's in a very dry environment, in a very tough environment, so it is torn into various parts, so it looks, you can see these uh, strips of leaves. Then mentioning, they don't grow to excessive heights. And as I mentioned, what makes them very unique is the fact that they grow, uh, they grow for quite an extended period. In other words, they live for quite an extended period of time, around about 500 to 600 years old. Now that we've gone through most of the content, let's look at some example questions. So let's look at the screen. We have labels A, B, C, and D. And basically it indicates various stages, uh, uh, various sections of the alternation of generations. And the first question then asks at the bottom, the first question then asks, but define the term. Now please do remember that biology is a science language, so it's always very important that you know the definitions or what the basic uh, terminology is. In this case, Alternation means switching from one to the other. And then, of course, you have your generations. So, if we talk about the alternation of generations, it basically refers to sporophyte. We know that's the one generation. And the other generation is, of course, the gametophyte generation. If you want to add more detail, you can, of course, then just remind yourself that the sporophyte is always diploid while the gametophyte is always haploid. And we know that going from sporophyte, in other words, going from diploid to haploid, that will, of course, require a process referred to as meiosis. The gametophyte will produce the gametes, as we know. So we will have the male gamete. We will have the female gamete. And then, of course, that would then lead to the production of a zygote. And the important process that we need to know there is, of course, fertilization. Okay, so that's the entire process. So, let's just get to what the term means. It is the changing, in other words, alternation. It is the changing uh, or switching between the sporophyte generation 
and the gametophyte generation. That is the basic answer. I just provided a bit more information because if you look at this information and you go back to the illustration, in other words, in the question, you actually have all your answers already. So let's move on to the next one. So, same illustration, question 1.2, it says, but identify, and remember, remember, you can actually do this in the exams, it's, a, it's an important exam or test writing skill, is to underline the verb so that you know exactly what you should do, so you must identify, what must you identify, and look here, it gives you the generations, which generations, A, and generation C. So we have two generations here. So now the important thing for you to, rem uh, to is to refer back to our previous discussion. In other words, which one of them would be, would be diploid? Mm, interesting. If you're not sure, be reminded that we get from diploid to haploid by this process, which is meiosis. So, the fact that I just indicated the, uh, the amount of chromosomes present, or the chromosomal component, it basically tells you that A is the sporophyte, and C is the gametophyte generation. Again, this goes back to our previous discussion. Let's go to the next question. The next question, same diagram, asks you to identify the labels. Again, you underline, and you can actually do this when you're writing a test or in the exams. Uh, underline the verb. So identify labels. Okay, so now it's, this, is not, this is not the generations anymore. So we're looking at identifying labels B, and D. So let's just recap. We said that A is your sporophyte generation. C is the gametophyte generation. So this already gives you an indication of what the answer is going to be. Your sporophyte is going to produce spores. Your gametophyte generation will of course produce gametes. Gametes of course, male and female gametes. And there you have your answer. Let's continue to question 1.4. Question 1.4 still relates to this diagram. And remember, going back, this is your sporophyte, gametophyte. So it's producing gametes here. And the question is, the question is, which process converts D to A? So we have our gametes. And how do we get the haploid gametes to the diploid sporophyte. You can see that we have one set of chromosomes here, two set of chromosomes. So that automatically tells us that the process that is required here is of course fertilization. And there we have the answer for 1.4. Right, looking at the next question. The next question refers to uh, the different groups. So again, it says, identify, it's your verb, the group. Hold it, so what are you thinking now? Which groups did we study? We studied the bryophytes, the pterophytes, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. Okay, but which of the four groups are they looking for? They're looking for the ones in group C. So here you can see, there we go, 
there we have group C. Now this you should remember because what we have here is here we have this little structure at the bottom, your gametophyte and growing out of the gametophyte we have the sporophyte generation and that is of course characteristic of your bryophytes. So that is the answer for question one there. Let's look at what question two. Which group is again identify the group, in other words which one of the four groups is represented by diagram G, which means we're looking at this one here. Now you remember we have these change the color, we have these le the roots present here at the bottom, we have a horizontal stem, we have a stalk growing out here and then you have your pinna and these would be representative of your pterophytes of which the, mo uh, of which, sorry, the fern is a very good example. To all the grade 11s, I hope that the presentation will help you in your preparation for tests, control tests and exams. We do know that there are many of you are very hard working students, so hopefully this presentation will prepare you as you complete your final grade 11 exams and head to grade 12 for the finals next year. Thank you.